Um, so, uh, so I think we'll just go ahead and start. And as people um, enter the room, they'll just join us. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to the colloquium of the uh, Bar-Ilan Graduate Program in Science, Technology and Society. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening with all of you. As I said, I, I, I'm sure there are gonna be more people than we usually have, which is really nice. And it's a pleasure to be with, with you, Steve. Steve Fuller, who is a wonderfully uh, iconoclastic and colorful figure and thinker. Um, and first off, I want to thank uh, Roly Belfer for making all this happen. It's uh, thanks to Oli that Steve is here. So um, tip my hat to you, Oli. Thanks a lot. Uh, great work. Um, I decided that I'm not going to belabor everyone with a long introduction. Most of you know Steve um, or you know a lot about him. You read his stuff. Um, um, and we have a short period of time. We want to allow time for questions and for discussion after Steve talks. So I think it's just best to get going. But I will say um, that Steve is the founder of the research program called Social Epistemology, which is the name of, um, of a quarterly journal, which he founded a, a while ago. I think it was like 1987. It's also the name of his uh, the first of the 25 books. Uh, major areas of research for Steve over the years have been the future of the university and critical intellectuals, the emergence of intellectual property in the information age, the interdisciplinary challenges in the natural sciences and the social sciences, um, political and epistemological consequences of the new biology uh, of the second half of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century, Science and religion, in particular, Steve has written about creationism um, and, and also the future of humanity. In particular, Steve has written about transhumanism. Steve's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He's a fellow of the UK Academy of Social Sciences, of the European Academy of Sciences and, uh, Sciences and Arts. He really is a, a, a brilliant and out of the box personality. Uh, this is the second time he's, he's um, 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 gracing us with his, with his uh, presence in our program in, in the last two years. He's also a, ve a very controversial figure, undoubtedly uh, probably the most polarizing STS figure of his generation, I'd say. Um, would you say that's, fi that, that's, that's fair, Steve? Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his, writings called, his writings have been called ignorant, incompetent, uh, gibberish by leading opponents, all of which Steve, I'm sure, wear, wears as badges of honor. Yep. Um, uh, so it's, it's always extremely uh, interesting, mind-opening, challenging to, uh, to hear Steve, to read Steve, um, even when you don't agree with him, uh, because he makes you uh, uh, work harder to uh, understand why you don't agree with him if you don't. Uh, and if you do agree with him, um, then for many, it opens, it opens the mind in interesting ways. So, um, so with that, Steve, I turn it over to you. And thanks again from the bottom of our hearts for joining us and agreeing to, uh, to uh, enlighten our community in these merry Corona days. So uh, off to you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. All righty. And hello to your kid. Uh <laughs> yes, this is Shizy. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, look, first of all, I want to thank uh, Roly and, and thank Oren and everyone else who's here. Um, I wish I could be with you in person. I mean, this is part of the reason why, in a sense, I'm doing this, is I should have been over there talking to you in person. Um, but um, let me just say, I'm going to speak, I guess, for about 40 minutes, maybe. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about is... Um, the post-truth condition, um, and I'm also going to integrate that with, you know, considerations about where we are now with regard to the coronavirus pandemic, um, and um, in a sense, the post-truth condition is that the two things are very closely related to each other, I think. Um, so let me start. I mean, I, I published a book a couple of years ago called The Post-Truth Condition, and I'm actually writing a follow-up book to it now. Um, and of course, the publisher wants me to talk about the pandemic as well. So there's going to be some trial balloons. 
uh, put out there about some of the things that I think about what's going on. But let me just start by saying um, my general view about the post-truth condition is that we've always had it in a sense. In other words, there's um, this is not a new thing. You can't blame it on um, Brexit or Trump or anything like that. Um, and, and in a sense, uh, I think the difference now is that the post-truth condition is not managed as well as it used to be, you might say. Um, and, and here I would trace the origins of the post-truth condition uh, to Plato and, and Plato's thinking about what was going on in Athens during his youth, uh, and in particular, the ways, the way in which um, Athens is rather free, um, democratic, at least for the people who were considered citizens, the way that sort of society um, actually created an enormous amount of volatility and instability, which eventually led uh, to the, um, to the uh, end of, uh, of Athens as a democracy. It got conquered by Sparta and later Persia, and, and then it became a colony of Rome and all the rest of it. Um, and, and Plato is basically in the Republic especially, but I think throughout all of his works, is reflecting on what was going on there. Um, and so his mouthpiece Socrates, who we often see as kind of presenting so-called, you know, the truth, um, What's more important about that is the fact that he, that Socrates, in a way, is trying to to manage what on the ground, dealing with all these sophists, is a post-truth condition in Athens. Okay, um, and um, of course, Plato's solution to this issue, uh, to put it in a nutshell, is basically to say, look, you have to kind of establish a common standard of of authority. Okay, um, and, 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 and authority in, in a sense, not simply from the standpoint of um, exercise of power, a monopoly of force, uh, as we often say in the modern era about the state, um, but in a sense, a kind of monopoly on credibility, uh, on epistemic legitimacy, right? And this is where we get the idea of a standard of truth from, is that there is in some sense uh, a kind of... Um, ultimate court of appeal with regard to knowledge claims. Um, and, and it's in terms of that, uh, that then we can make decisions of, of a binding sort, right? Um, that um, something is true or something is false, something's allowed, something's not allowed and so forth. And the construction of the Republic is basically about that. Uh, and that's kind of the way, you know, Plato's strategy for resolving the post-truth condition in his time. Um, and, and, it, and it seems to me that this has been kind, you know, you might say this is kind of the starting point of the issue. Um, and there are a lot of issues that are sort of implied by this, um, you know, and, and, I, and I would say that a lot of the, um, how should we say, um, suspicion, or distrust uh, that we have seen of democracy over the centuries. In fact, until um, the 19th century, I would say, um, comes from this kind of platonic bias. Um, and, um, and it seems to me that what we call truth and the condition, the truth condition, right? That there, are, that there is in some sense some fact of the matter that can be resolved about various things. Um, comes from this kind of sensibility. And it's from this sensibility um, that we start to begin to think about epistemic guardians and experts and all of this kind of stuff. And of course, historically, uh, these people have been largely religious authorities. Uh, but of course, in the modern era, uh, they become scientific authorities. And one of the things that's very interesting about science in this context um, is in a sense, the authority can be regularly tested, okay? And so what we talk about the scientific method, right, uh, which Francis Bacon and all these people introduce in the early modern period, is basically about that, right? So in other words, um, one doesn't want to completely abandon uh, what Plato was up to in trying to resolve the post-truth condition of Athens, but of course, one wants to be able to test what the authorities are actually up to. 
And the scientific method, in a way, uh, was designed to provide that kind of uh, testing environment, you might say. And I would say that as we move into the modern period more directly, into the Enlightenment and into the 19th and 20th centuries, um, most of the philosophers who have had a kind of um, rationalistic approach to justifying democracy have been in one way or another trying to extend the scientific method into the testing environment of ordinary public life. Okay. And here, whether we're talking about Condorcet or Mill or Popper or people like this, um, I, I think this is kind of what we're talking about here, where there is a sense that, it, that, that, that one can still have some kind of stability, epistemic stability, epistemic uh, authority, uh, but it is one that is constantly tested in a methodical way and where the outcomes of this methodical testing um, is actually regarded as binding by all the people who would be governed by it. And I think this is kind of the interesting, in a way, interesting kind of political epistemological uh, kind of duality here. Namely, um, it's important not only um, that the tests work on their own terms, you might say, at an epistemological level, but it's also important that the tests are seen to work by the people who would be governed by them. So they have to appear legitimate. Um, and this is where I think when you start looking at, let's say, uh, logical positivism, and again, Popper, I think, would be part of this as well, in the 20th century, there is an enormous amount of emphasis placed on these tests of authority being public, right? Being, uh, and, and that, in fact, the preconditions to being able to recognize that these tests of authority are legitimate are, doesn't require a lot of prior knowledge or expertise or education even, but rather uh, uh, requires only fairly basic abilities to be able to perceive things and to be able to count and calculate things, right? And, and, and so this kind of reductionism, this kind of epistemological reductionism that we often seen as, you know, characteristic of what we call, broadly speaking, positivistic thinking um, is in fact part of this kind of attempt to, in a way, respect the kinds of concerns that Plato has, but in a sense, democratize them as this, at the same time. Um, and so the drive for people to have scientific education, which I would say is part of the general drive toward literacy and all the rest of it, is in a sense being able um, to, to enable people uh, not only to think critically and all of that, but also to be able to understand at their own level, um, you know, how to evaluate various knowledge claims that are being put forward before them, okay? And this is, you know, from a post-truth standpoint, this is in a sense how I would see kind of the history of philosophy and maybe, you know, Western culture more generally, uh, where you start with Plato with a kind of very strong, you might say even overreaction uh, to the volatility to the post-truth condition in Athens, um, which, over the, which, which led to, you might say, an, a great aversion to democracy generally, um, gradually opening up. And in a sense, the opening up, you know, if you had to put a kind of period on this, I, I think the opening up begins, you know, where we start to wanting to dem democratize expertise and wanting to, um, you know, open up the uh, the field of evaluation of the testing conditions of knowledge to a larger number of people. This arises with the, the rise of mass literacy, um, I would say. And, and here uh, in my writing, I, for a long time now, have put a particular stress on the role that the Protestant Reformation played in, in, Christian, in the history of Christianity, because the whole thing about Protestantism, I think, is really important to remember. Um, is that they basically believe that uh, you cannot trust the priests to tell you what to do, right? But rather you have to take the Bible into your own hands and you have to be able to understand it and interpret it for yourselves. And in a sense, internalize that in a way that you kind of live or buy by the, live or die rather, by the interpretation that you place on it. And this is one reason why in, the, in Christianity, uh, there are so many different denominations of Protestantism because groups of people, communities of people reading the same Bible 
are basically drawing different conclusions about what's true and false and how they should live their lives. And, and, and in fact, secularism uh, in the modern era, starting in the 18th century, is largely an outgrowth of that general development. Okay, and by the time we start getting to Feuerbach in the late 19th century, what we call modern atheism is in a way an out, you know, the, the, the particular shape it takes is largely an outgrowth of that too. Um, and, and so this seems to me, and what this ends up getting you to in, 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 in kind of the way we are now and, and the context in which um, people are, you know, talking disparagingly about the post-truth condition today um, is basically a situation where, first of all, you have an, a large number of people who are, who are more educated than ever before, like it or not. They might not be educated in the right ways from the standpoint of the kind of schooling they've got, but there is no doubt there's a mass amount of education, mass literacy, and moreover, starting with the internet in the late 1990s, we have this mass access to information, right, where in a sense, the sort of last, you might say, stopgap to, you know, for, for epistemic authority, you know, the universities, the academic experts, people like that, right, they are now regularly being, you know, being bombarded with all this kind of alternative, so-called alternative stuff on the internet, which people can consult for themselves. And so in any kind of issue, no matter how complex it is, there is always going to be some entry point within the internet within which people can actually, um, you know, access what they, you know, what they want to understand, what they need to know, and all the rest of it. Moreover, um, we also live in a, in a world, as a partly, largely as a result of this, where um, it has become much more common and recognized uh, that knowledge production is a kind of collective process. It's not that this was unknown, obviously, you know, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, the, the, the rest of the previous history. But now when you see things like Wikipedia and the various Wikimedias and the, you know, open source stuff and all of that, uh, people are much more used to and comfortable with the idea uh, that knowledge production and distribution is a very fluid thing. And so the whole idea that there needs to be some kind of consensus of judgment on the on the basis of which, um, you know, everyone should believe various things and do various things. Uh, that's also that intuition is also being eroded. Okay. Um, now again, this is not happening. I would say in any kind of systematic or philosophically appropriate way or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but nevertheless, it is happening. Uh, and so this then leads to a sort of greater tolerance of alternative points of view. But I suppose more importantly, it leads to a greater willingness of people to actually put their claims out there, right? To, you know, not be ashamed to say crazy stuff or stuff that in the past would be seen as crazy. And so that then places a greater burden on people today. And, and I think people are taking up the challenge in various ways to have to assess things for themselves. Um, and and this, is, um, this is where I think philosophy the philosophy of science and you know uh, other branches of, of philosophy that deal with knowledge is a bit behind the curve uh, because I do think the idea of um, it's very fashionable in epistemology to talk nowadays or at least and even for the past 20 30 years maybe to talk about delegating judgment right trusting experts right this kind of thing where in a sense what you do is you let somebody else decide the matter for you uh, and then you just follow what they say. Um, and of course, there have always been these arguments, well, these other people know more about something than you do. Um, this, I think, this intuition, again, uh, I think is very much eroded in the post-truth condition. And um, the, the reason for that isn't simply because there are a lot of alternatives out there. It's also because I think it's part of the uh, publicity function. Right. One of the things that's happened with the Internet and our access to communications is that we're actually uh, have much more. Um, we're able to track things a lot better. And maybe some of us are able to track things a lot better than others, China being an example. Uh, but nevertheless, the ability to know more about what's going on in the world and being able to, as it were, make public, you know, make judgments publicly 
So, you know, I see inside people's homes at the moment. You see what's inside my home. You can make your judgments, right? These things in the past, right, that would not be available. So there is a sense in which it's a kind of transparency also of the culture. And that kind of transparency actually gives people uh, quite a lot of confidence, justified or not, uh, to judge things for themselves. Um, and, and I should say in this context, an interesting precedent um, occurred in the 1920s when um, Walter Lippmann, the great American journalist, uh, was um, in, a, in a debate that lasted for a few years uh, with John Dewey, the philosopher, um, and, and their debate was basically about, um, you might say, the ontological status of public opinion, which was something that Littmann really put on the table um, in the period. And one of the issues that came up there, which, was, uh, which is very interesting uh, and, and relates to the wor world we live in now, had to do with this um, emerging phenomena uh, of mass media, in particular radios um, and, and also um, newspapers with the ability to be able to uh, print uh, photographs of things happening far away, kind of on an overnight basis because of the increase in technology and so forth. Um, and uh, one of the things that Littmann was very concerned about um, and this is, I think, echoes a lot with a lot of the concerns that people today have about the post-truth condition, um, is that um, Lippmann believed that there was a kind of false sense of immediacy that came from the fact, let's say, that on the radio, uh, you can hear the president or, you know, the prime minister or the dictator uh, be able to tell you certain things you know, and people claiming certain things are happening, and that, that, that sensory immediacy that comes from being able to hear it, that that might, in a sense, give you a false sense of confidence about what's really going on out there, okay? Um, and, um, and so he, for Littmann, this was kind of the biggest problem as far as the mass media and democracy was concerned, was that perhaps the mass media would somehow, people would feel somehow emboldened and empowered uh, and as a result, make a lot of errors of judgment because of a false sense of transparency, okay? They think they know more than they really do because somehow the senses are being strongly impacted by it. And of course, if you see what happened in, in Europe uh, during uh, the 1930s and 40s, um, you know, you can get a sense of where Littmann's coming from on this. Uh, and so part of what Littmann was trying to do and, and, you know, Littmann was a student of philosophy at Harvard University, okay? He studied with William James and all these major figures in the early, you know, like the first decade of the 20th century. Um, he was, in a sense, trying to reinvent Plato, basically. Um, and and uh, his idea, you know, that we associate these days with objective journalism, which is this kind of studied neutrality of how you present things, right? Um, and, and so, you know, when you see the anchor people on television and, and, and all of this, in a sense, um, he was very sensitive, as it were, to the, um, and, and I think this is very much part of what Plato was sensitive to. So Littmann, I think, is very much a kind of 20th century reinvention of Plato. Um, he was sensitive to the fact that, you, you know, if you're going to, you know, that, that if you're going to have a kind of stable epistemic environment, from which you can govern without too much difficulty, um, you need a kind of rhetoric of truth, you might say, right? A rhetor the appearance of truth, right? Given that people are always going to be moved by appearances, right? You grant that, right? I mean, Plato's divided line, you know all this, right? Littman saying, well, okay, the mass media is like the latest version of this, um, that the journalists who are kind of, you might say, the front, right? They're the facade, of, of what the world is doing, need to adopt a, a kind of uh, a, a sort of a posture, a sort of demeanor uh, of uh, equanimity, neutrality, present the stuff, right? And, and generally speaking, um, give a sense that, uh, you know, this is what's happening in the world and the people who are doing this stuff and are responsible for taking decisions have it under control. Right, they got it under control. They know what's going on. Yes, it's tough. Yes, there's conflict. Yes, there's war. Yes, there's all this stuff happening. Uh, but the people who are in charge of taking the big decisions uh, know what's going on. And so you can sleep at night 
you know, uh, without any problem. And indeed, you should go about doing your normal business without losing too much sleep over what's happening. I mean, this is kind of, I would say, Walter Lippmann's ideal notion, right? So, so he would belong to the kind of school that we often see today in the political science discussion of democratic theory, which says if people are very keen to vote, right, uh, then that probably means the democracy is in trouble, right? Because it means in some sense that, um, you know, they don't think things are being addressed properly and so forth. And, and, and so what you really want is people to think about voting as in a way a ratification of the way in which the democracy normally ticks over. And so Littman's the sort of guy who would accept, you know, an expert political class, you might say, right? The kind of people who know how to operate, you know, very much like what when we traditionally talk about uh, di diplomats, right? Diplomats and, and the kind of, you know, diplomats from around the world all kind of schooled the same way. They all kind of knew each other at some point in their youth and, and they kind of manage the world together and everyone else can kind of stay calm. Um, I, I think this is kind of what Littman would like, uh, in a sense that the worst instincts, the worst, um, you might say, uh, uh, the, the, the animal spirits of democracy would somehow be tamed. Um, and, and the mass media could be used for that, right? This is the point, right? So, so there's a sense in which, you know, Littman wasn't about, um, uh, you know, kind of shutting down radio or, or television or anything like that. Uh, but rather that the medium be used in a very kind of strategic sort of way. And so I would say, for example, um, you know, if you look at Britain, where I'm living, uh, if you look at the BBC uh, and, and kind of the original remit of the BBC, uh, which is associated with uh, John Reith, um, you know, we, the, the BBC has a, a threefold mission historically and still does, which is to... Um, inform, uh, educate, and entertain, okay? Uh, and that's kind of the, that's the message. And that's always, and then if you look at the history of the BBC, um, uh, especially with regard to the other commercial channels, you know, that have existed, because in the UK, we've, we've had commercial channels pretty much the whole time. Uh, they've become more important in, in the recent years. Uh, you see the difference. You kind of see the difference. Uh, and, and I think this is the kind of thing that Littman was going for, is a kind of a reinvention of Plato for times where things, you know, you, things are democratic, uh, but you can somehow control, you can somehow steer, nudge maybe might be the word to talk about this, um, sort of the animal spirits of democracy in a way that people don't get too overconfident that what they're hearing and seeing is really how things are, right? That they'll take a step back. They won't just immediately gravitate towards something. Um, and of course, you know, you know, the, the uh, Littman, Littman was worried about, of course, as the years went on, the kind of way in which demagogues can use the mass media. Um, there is no doubt, especially if you look at the role that radio played in the 1930s in terms of shoring up the, uh, the popular base of all kinds of people who otherwise would not have a, a hearing, um, you know, that kind of thing disturbed him, okay? Um, but I also do think, uh, and this is where it gets kind of interesting in a way, uh, is another thing that disturbed him about, about uh, democratization um, had to do actually with the commercialization side, okay? What we might call the capitalist side of mass media not just the demagogic side, but the, the capitalist side. And, and, and some of you may know, if you know something about uh, Walter Lippmann's life, was that he, um, he, in, 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 uh, he was part of this uh, team of people, young people, um, who uh, Woodrow Wilson recruited uh, in, in the 1914 in, in uh, uh, to 1917, to actually uh, drum up support for uh, American entry into the First World War. Um, and um, just to remind you, right, uh, the First World War, uh, which turned out to be the, at, you know, by the time it ended was the bloodiest war uh, the world had ever known and all of that stuff. Um, nevertheless, America was never formally attacked. 
Uh, and yet America did go into the war, and this was an incredibly unusual move for the United States, which uh, up to that point, even though it was this growing, prosperous kind of nation, um, nevertheless tried to keep out as much as possible from world affairs, okay? Um, now, the exception that began in the 20th century, which is quite interesting, and I don't want to go into it in too much detail, was, of course, people like Theodore Roosevelt uh, and Wilson, uh, and both of these guys are part of what we call the progressive movement in the United States. Um, and, and they are uh, the people who are basically responsible for, as it were, refashioning the image of the United States uh, to become uh, this kind of global policeman, this global superpower kind of thing, which became part of what, um, what Lippmann himself eventually called the American century. Okay, I don't know if this is about to end, but the point is uh, that this is kind of where it begins. Um, and um, the per the, one of the people who Lippmann was working with in this campaign to get America into World War I was Edward Bernays, who is often seen as the father of public relations and wrote a very famous book in 1928 called Propaganda. Um, and um, after the war was over, um, there is this kind of internal struggle. The two of, I mean, Bernays and, and Littman are roughly contemporaries in terms of age. Bernays, you may know, is a, was a cousin of Freud, did his, uh, did his undergraduate degree at Cornell University. Um, and, um, and there's this struggle, you might say, as to, because the propaganda machine that actually persuaded Americans to enter World War I was phenomenal, okay? Uh, in the sense that you, bas you basically, the, 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 the campaign was about making Americans, um, you might say, uh, ex uh, re re return the gratitude of the Europeans who came over to settle the country. This was the basic pitch. Um, and so in other words, they should go back and help to save Europe. This was the uh, pitch in World War I. Uh, it worked. So by the time America entered World War I, Right, all kinds of troops were being committed overseas over a relatively short period of time because America only entered in 1917. The war ends in 1918, uh, and a lot of Americans got killed in it too. That's another matter. Um, and and the, but the point is, people were motivated. They they changed their minds, and so both Lippmann and Bernays realized that in a democratic setting where people have access to information and so forth. Right, this kind of ability to steer public opinion is incredibly powerful, okay? And for this reason, Littman took the platonic turn and basically said, look, we have to steer, we have to guide this, we have to shape this thing in some way. And what he didn't want was he didn't want uh, what we call advertising, marketing, public relations. He didn't want that to be a purely commercial enterprise left to the free market, okay? because he thought that that would then lead to all kinds of people, right, trying to exploit in a way, um, you know, the, with through sensationalism and various kinds of appeals to emotion and all the rest of it, um, you know, people to do various things, buy various things, and so forth. Um, and so he was very much against commercial television, commercial radio, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and of course, he was very much against the kind of, you know, Bernays is regarded as the father of public relations, as I mentioned, and he was very much against that kind of enterprise, which of course very quickly became, uh, I mean, arguably, the dominant feature of uh, capitalist development in the 20th century, especially as, a, as the price of producing things starts to drop dramatically through increased technological efficiency and so forth. So if you look at a lot of major firms and so forth, right, nowadays the actual production cost for whatever they produce is not that much, but what matters, what is really the money gets put into is the advertising, is the marketing, is the public relations. And the interesting thing about this, if you read Bernays' works, is that Bernays basically says that uh, actually public relations is, you might say, education in public for a democracy. Right, public. So Bernays knows exactly what he's doing. Right, he's a very educated man too, but he is going to reinvent kind of the sophist line on this, 
And he's going to say, look, you know, when we tell you stuff about goods and, you know, we tell you about certain person is worth voting for in an election and so forth, we're actually giving you information that you need to know. And we trust you to make your own judgment. And we're just trying to present this in a way that will appeal to you. But then it's up to you to make the decision. Bernays is very clear. He's always very clear whenever he justifies what he's doing. It's very much like that. You have to trust the intelligence of the consumer. You have to trust the intelligence of the voter. Why do we have all this paternalism, right? I mean, this is kind of the line that he promotes from the very beginning. Um, and so the idea, so this phrase gets used a lot, um, and you may have heard it from Chomsky, uh, because you know Chomsky, in, in, a, in an interesting way, taking kind of Littman line with regard to the mass media, right? The manufacture of consent, the engineering of consent, you see, Bernays uses the phrase engineering consent uh, because for him, engineering is a good thing because engineering, as it were, provides the kind of infrastructure, the kind of smart environment, you might say, within which people can make intelligent choices. So for him, that's a very positive phrase, engineering consent. But for Littman, who then uses the term manufacture consent, uh, manufacturing suggests fabrication right? That in some sense, we're getting people to believe things they shouldn't believe, right? Uh, and, that, and so this is kind of the duality. This is kind of the, the two positions that end up uh, basically uh, the two forces that are arguing against each other in the 20th century once we, you know, embark in this period of unprecedented information exposure. Um, and I would say, you know, generally speaking, Bernays won that argument, or has won that argument. And the question is, as we move into the next phase of this with the internet, um, whether, you know, that's sustainable, right? Um, and and in, a, in a sense, I think this is kind of uh, where we are, uh, namely the extent to which the post-truth condition is in fact uh, sustainable. And so, one of the things that um, that uh, I would raise at this point uh, is that, in a sense, this question, the sustainability of the post-truth condition, um, isn't a question about um, whether people get things wrong too often, okay? Um, because, in a sense, uh, democracy, you know, and this is the whole point of constitutions and democracy and all the rest of it, in a sense, uh, Democracy is a form of governance that we've had now, you know, in various forms uh, in over the last 200 years, let's say, um, has, when, when it's been established uh, in, in some kind of thoughtful constitutional fashion, like the US Constitution and all the constitutions that we've seen since the 19th, you know, 18th, 19th century, et cetera, um, these, these documents, uh, have basically uh, presupposed that people are fallible, that people will make mistakes, um, and, and that reflects, in fact, the kind of people who are making the decisions. Namely, you know, these are people who have uh, inadequate access to information or whatever, never enough, right? They have biases and prejudices and all these cognitive limitations stuff we talk about a lot these days in psychology. Um, this was well known to the people who uh, drafted the constitutions uh, uh, for democratic uh, societies. But the key thing, the key thing in all this was that decisions are reversible, right? And moreover, within the structure, there is something like checks and balances in the sense that whatever decisions get made, uh, they don't have a kind of overriding authority over any other subsequent decisions by other parties that might be made, right? There are limits to what the remit of a decision is in terms of its scope. Um, and so the U.S. Constitution, I think, is a great example of this, actually, because as you know, if you're familiar with American history, uh, you know, the presidents of the United States, let's say, uh, they're a very mixed bag of people, okay? Uh, and there are a lot of idiots and dummies in the bunch. But nevertheless, the country manages to remain um, and, and, uh, and, and bounces back. Uh, and as long as you have an electoral system, right, where on a regular basis people are able to toss the bastards out of office, as we say, um, then the system kind of works. So it's, 
So the point I want to make here is that when we talk about the sustainability of the post-truth condition, we're not talking about the possibility that if a lot of people are making decisions about stuff, um, they might get it wrong because they've always got it wrong in a sense. They're always getting it wrong. Uh, but the key thing is reversibility and checks and balances. So the errors end up having a kind of limiting effect, a limited effect, but perhaps more importantly, uh, that one can learn from the errors, and this is where the publicity of the errors becomes quite important, that one sees that when a judgment is taken, right, and, and, and all, the, you know, all the reasoning leading up to it perhaps is transparent, but also the consequences are transparent, right, that one sees, in fact, whether something works or not, and then one can make further judgments as to whether carry on or to change course, okay? And democracies already have that kind of thing built into it. Um, but of course, um, the, the, the sustainability issue arises because of the vastly, um, you might say, extended numbers of decision points, right? The various different kinds of things where people increasingly are making decisions and the way the consequences of these decisions interact with each other, okay? I think this is more the issue, um, right? So in other words, um, you know, the thing about a constitution uh, in a democratic society is that actually the decision points in which people vote, you know, and have to do stuff um, is relatively limited, actually, right? I mean, you let somebody basically take over your government for four years in the, if you're a president and you just put up with it until the next election. But I think, you know, as decision making gets more and more devolved and as people demand that their decision making gets more and more devolved, um, it, you know, one worries that uh, democracy can turn very much into the kind of phenomena that is actually associated with the kind of thing Bernays was very familiar with, which was, um, you know, fashion trends and all of this kind of stuff, stock market trends where there's a lot of boom and bust, right? And, and unless there is some kind of uh, safety net provided by the government, right? Things can get really good and then really bad and, and all kinds of people can be affected in all kinds of unintended ways. And I think that's kind of more the issue um, that we're, we're dealing with now with regard to the post-truth condition. And I don't think that kind of issue actually gets addressed very well by simply talking about following the people who you think are likely to be right or follow the people who have some track record in something that you regard as an expertise in the subject and so forth. Um, I think it has a lot more to do uh, with having more robust institutions, right, in, in this kind of constitutional sense that I'm talking about. And so one of the things that I find worrisome about um, the world we live in now, especially given the sorts of people who promote this increased democratization of knowledge and so forth, is that they're not really uh, talking very much about the kind of new constitutions and new institutions that will be needed to manage the multiple decisions being made at multiple points with multiple impacts on multiple people, okay? And, and so a kind of com you know, complex constitutionalism is in a sense required now, um, you know, which is to say a real step change, a real scaling up uh, and deepening of the kinds of processes that I think, let's say, the United States founding fathers were uh, engaged in when they were designing the American Constitution, you know, taking into account all of the uncertainty, all of the, you know, the wide disparity of interests and competences and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, if you read the Federalist Papers, I mean, you see these guys were really trying to think this out pretty carefully with a very long-term horizon in, in mind, which is, you know, one of the important reasons why the U.S. Constitution has survived as long as it has, notwithstanding not only the various idiots who've been president of the United States, but also the way in which the, the, the composition of the country has changed so radically over the last 200 years. So I think in the sense, this is kind of where, you know, the argument about post-truth ought to begin is on this kind of point that I'm raising now about the need for a new kind of democratic constitutionalism, you know, revisiting all the points that I've been 
making all along. Um, now I realize I've been talking for a long time, looking at the clock, and, and my, my inclination, I was gonna say something directly about the pandemic issue, but maybe this might be a good time for people to respond and get their questions so that in a sense I can folk, you know, so insofar as this stuff relates to the pandemic stuff, which I think it does, uh, it would be interesting to see how people, you know, kind of plug into this. And I'm happy because I've thought about the pandemic thing a lot as well, let me tell you. Um, but it would be interesting to get your feedback and to integrate your concerns about this into what I've been saying so far. So can I end it there? Perfect. All right, so does everyone hear me? Um, you should do. Okay, so thanks a lot, Steve. Super interesting. Um, we'll start off with a question from Ori, uh, who writes um, the following. Some scholars who deal with social epistemology, like Sismundo, Lynch, and Shapin, write about truth denial and epistemic democracy of a collective knowledge production. And the question is, is it possible to locate your view in the map of common existing views in social epistemology? Huh. So a larger question. To start okay, off given that I'm supposed to be the founder of it, you know, I should have an answer, but maybe I stand outside of it, you know, like God does. Um, you know, so uh, look, my, my, my view in a way has not really changed in this respect. My view has not really changed very much uh, over the past 30 plus years that I've been doing this stuff. Um, I've always believed social epistemology, part of its mission is to actually reconstitute the way in which we think about the nature of knowledge. Um, it's not just an add-on. It's not just, you know, knowledge is normally um, individual and therefore we have to add a social bid and all of this stuff. So, you know, as I said in my talk, I'm very a lot of the stuff that I'm against is a lot of the stuff that the people who do more mainstream social epistemology do. I really think at the end of the day, social epistemology is about the construction of epistemic institutions that actually um, in a way can command universal assent, at least for a given society, uh, in, to the extent that people will be bound by the judgment. So in a sense, this is this thing I was talking about toward the beginning of the talk, uh, is really what I believe social epistemology is about. So Plato is, in a sense, the first social epistemologist, but I'm sort of on the democratic side of this, and so I have a lot of sympathy, you know, as we move into talking about Condorcet or, or, or uh, Mill and people like that. And for that reason, I think the debate between Littmann and Bernays is a very interesting one, because I think that's kind of where social epistemology ought to be focused. Um, it, it's really, I mean, words like trust, uh, you know, and delegation of authority and all this kind of stuff is really beside the point. I mean, I think the problem with a lot of the mainstream analytic social epistemology is that they're still using these old tools. They, in a sense, you know, they just are repurposing a lot of very traditional ways of talking about things in philosophy without recognizing, you know, kind of what the challenge is once you take very seriously that knowledge is a collectively constructed enterprise and basically, the people who do it are the ones who are going to have to live with the consequences of it. Ori, is there a, uh, a follow-up that you'd like to ask to that, to, to that reply? Or are you good? And in general, anyone else? The floor is open. Um, Come on, there must be someone. No, no, just give them time. Can, I, uh, can I ask? Uh, it over. Yes, Roly, please. Can I, can I use the mic? Sure. I can hear you. Great. Um, so what I uh, wanted to ask, and maybe I'm aiming this um, towards the, the current situation as, as a case in point, is that um, I, I get the, the map of... Uh, turning away from the sophist way of doing things, uh, and then maybe uh, in, in a roundabout way, in various ways, we've been, we've been returning to it without admitting so. Um, and yet we spend a lot of time, especially in our department, we spend a lot of time trying to, um, uh, to parse out in, in an inclusive way the various types of knowledge and knowledge making that are possible. Uh, a technical expertise, theoretical, um, a local knowledge, native knowledge, 
um, and of course the democratic uh, versions of, of these things. Um, but there's always, as you say, there's always this, this um, uh, given approach that there should be a way of um, of making a positive uh, current situation, it seems like all of these things are being for, uh, from the various sources. I, I missed I a little know, bit of this. Can you, can you backtrack a little? Missed a little bit of this. So the, the various, the various types of knowledge that, that we try to track, uh, in the current situation, um, it, it seems to me like they've been like thrown into a blender. Um, mm -hmm. I, I try to, to, as you say, find out for myself from the data sources. Um, I try to ask the experts. I try to make my own mind up. I try to think it's inside the box, outside the box. Uh, and what I've been thinking of asking you about this is what does your, what, what does the approach that you just laid out, um, offer me, um, uh, with regards to the to the mess that we're dealing with right now. Okay. Um, first of all, it's this is a very unique situation, um, not only in the ways everybody else has said, but I think also epistemologically, because um, the general, um, you might say, trajectory of a kind of uh, democratic knowledge production, um, and this is certainly what I would say is the case since. Uh, Protestantism has been basically you give people more and more scope to take decisions uh, about themselves, right? Because not only because they are they they learn more and they're in fact obliged to learn more. I mean, the key thing about Protestantism, of course, is you're not a Protestant unless you read the Bible very closely. So you have to actually get engaged with the source materials. Um, but at the same time, also uh, you live with the consequences of it. Right. So in other words, you have to have a kind of world where people are willing, where you're willing to let people live with the consequences of their decisions. This is a really important point. It's a strongly anti-paternalistic point. Uh, and the Enlightenment really pushed this line very hard. However, the problem with the pandemic is that the decisions you take impact on other people who did not take that decision. Right. This is the problem. Right, the pandemic, and the pandemic is not the only thing that does this. Right, there are other kinds of uh, decisions that people take. Right, where the the consequences of those decisions have all kinds of negative externalities, you might say, for other people, and that's where you really need to have some kind of constitution, right, democratic constitution, where there are checks and balances and so forth that can actually restrict the scope of the consequences of the decisions that people take when it looks like they're gonna impact on the lives of other people who did not take that decision, okay? Um, and that is very, very tricky, okay? That is very, very tricky because we're basically, you know, the whole point about the democratization of knowledge production is largely, I would say, a libertarian trajectory. It is one where people you know, uh, consult the sources for themselves, take decisions for themselves, and live with the consequences of those decisions, and other people let them, right? That's the, that's the non-paternalistic point. Unfortunately, we don't live, there are a lot of decisions that you can't actually operate that way. And so even before the pandemic, of course, uh, the example that I was using as late as December before this whole coronavirus thing broke was the issue of the anti-vaccination, right? If, you, if, if, if the, if the anti-vaccination mentality affects a large enough number of the population so that people don't want to vaccinate their kids, this has an enormous knock-on effect on the entire society, most of whom may otherwise be vaccinating their kids, perhaps. I mean, you know, the point is that these consequences um, do matter. So I think that's the tricky part. For me, that is kind of the tricky part. Um, how are you able to manage this kind of expansion of decision making um, where you actually do want people to absorb the consequences of what they do, but without unintentionally harming other people in the process? I think that ultimately is going to end up being kind of where the line is on this. And I think the pandemic, in a way, you know, we in Britain 
which, which tends to be very liberal about stuff, um, we are struggling with this, okay? So, so I do think this is something that the government is really trying to fine tune on, on this kind of matter. But that's where I think the issue lands in that case. Okay, great. Uh, so the questions are coming, coming in uh, fast and heavy. Uh, there's a question by uh, Tzvi Reich, who would like to ask it in person. So Tzvi, uh, you are unmuted and invited to... Uh, Okay. Thank you, Stephen, for, for this wonderful lecture. And uh, I'm a communication uh, researcher, and uh, I'm quite amazed to see how central was the issue of media in uh, your talk. Um, don't you think that there are two uh, special challenges? One is the growing complexity of social life, and the other is common sense in areas that are counterintuitive, areas of theories uh, that are counterintuitive. Okay, first of all, thank you for the question. I mean, the complexity issue is in a sense, um, the issue that I've been raising, I raised in the previous, it's implied in my answer to the previous question. Um, I don't use the word complexity very much because uh, I often think that word implies a lot more mathematics that I'm willing to put on the table. Uh, but, um, but I do think this is kind of what we're talking about when we look at the interaction effects of people making decisions, right? They don't just impact on themselves, but they impact on others. Um, so yes, so that is, that is definitely there. Um, the other issue uh, about um, the what was the the other issue was about uh, oh oh about the counterintuitiveness yes yes the counterintuitiveness um, you know um, I, I think um, counterintu counterintuitiveness uh, in a democracy uh, is actually a lot harder to pin down I mean because here's the thing right if, if when we talk, when we, you know, because this word, you know, talking about things as being intuitive or counterintuitive, um, this is a very familiar way of talking in, in philosophy, but that's because philosophy, and, and, and of course other fields, psychology as well, right, uh, start from a fairly strong normative position on this, right, namely that we've got kind of the normal way of seeing the world, right, and then there's this other way of seeing the world. Um, and, and so as long as, you know, you're able to make that kind of binary, then one can identify certain things as being intuitive and other things as being counterintuitive. The problem with the kind of world we live in now is, um, contrary to this distinction, I don't think this is so helpful anymore, okay? Um, you know, so... Uh, and, and, and so as a result, um, I think what you find instead of intuitive versus counterintuitive is simply a kind of spectrum of different views. And it may be important, right, to actually identify kind of what the, um, what the spectrum's exactly about. What do all these people are actually disagreeing about where they have different opinions? Because that's some, sometimes not as it seems, right? Sometimes, you know, when people have, as it were, different intuitions about, you know, how things work and how the world is, um, it's, it, it's because, in fact, um, there's something, there's some kind of continuum, perhaps, some kind of dimension along which they're actually holding quite substantially different views. And, and so then it becomes important to identify that, right, uh, in order to actually be able to ga gauge correctly what the nature of the disagreement is. So, so, so this is kind of where I would pitch this kind of concept that you're bringing to the table. Um, uh, you see, because I, I do think the idea of counterintuitive presumes a lot more stability in terms of the normal way of seeing the world than I think something like the post-truth condition takes for granted. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm seeing the questions can be more or less kind of categorized into historical questions, more theoretical, philosophical questions, and then sort of questions of the day. Sure. So I'm going to try to do it kind of chronologically and, 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 and stick with history for the moment. So we have a question here from Michael Robach. Um, my question is, what does Steve think about the idea that the model concerning the pursuit of truth changed from looking for consensus to a model taken from the business world where you try to 
to make a good deal and where consensus is not really important? Well, I mean, I, I, let's put it this way. Um, at, 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 uh, as a first approximation, yes. Okay, so as a first approximation. However, uh, I do think, um, you know, again, this is one of these issues where the, uh, the dichotomy may not be as sharp as it seems. Um, so, if, you know, again, some, some one of your previous questioners uh, mentioned uh, Shapen. Um, and, uh, of course, um, you know, what is he about? Um, when we talk about, um, you know, his, you know, the broadly kind of shape and social constructivist view of the scientific method is basically a lot of gentlemen agreeing together, okay? Um, and, and while that is, you know, a very kind of crass way of putting it, um, you do have to ask, well, what does that amount to? Is that a consensus or is that a negotiation? Okay, um, and, and in a sense, you know, that is, always, that's always been kind of the thing about the scientific method, right? Uh, and I, I mentioned this in the, in the talk as well, that it's, it's not an, it's, it's, you know, a lot is going to depend on who exactly is going to be bound by the decision that's taken, okay? And I think the difference between talking about this in terms of a consensus and, uh, and in terms of a, a negotiation as in business is that in business, um, there is actually a much more transparent understanding of who's exactly bound by the decision that's taken among the parties concerned. Whereas the notion of consensus is kind of a bit vague uh, and seems to suggest that a lot of people who weren't in the room when the decision were taken are also going to be bound by the decision taken in the room, right? So in other words, the non-scientists are bound by the decisions taken by the scientists. Uh, and I think that is kind of what the difference ends up boiling down to in practice. Uh, okay, we got a thumbs up from Michael, meaning that he doesn't have a follow-up. Thank uh, you. Let's go, let's go to a more theoretical question. Uh, Maya Shmailov would like to hear Fuller's take about the difference between inter, inter, interpretability of data and explainability of data delivered to, to the public. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think in the first instance, um, I think in the first instance, the thing that matters is interpretability. Okay. Um, and this is what transparency primarily addresses. So in other words, um, the data has to be made available to people in a way that they can actually make sense of it by whatever framework they're going to be using to make sense of it. Okay. Um, and I take it that uh, the logical positivists and you know, here I would, uh, you know, focus, you know, Otto Neurath deserves a lot of credit for this because some of you may know Otto Neurath developed a whole pictogram kind of scheme, right, where data could be re represented, you know, complex economic data could be represented pictorially so that people could immediately see, as it were, you know, cost of living issues, employment issues, all kinds of things very directly, right? Um, and so this is an issue about interpretability, right, being able to be able to understand the data, be able to, 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 to kind of uh, prefigure the data in some kind of way. So that's the primary concern, it would seem to me. Um, and, and, and there is some way to go on this, let me tell you. And I think one of the reasons why, you know, why it's interesting that the internet has so many different ways, so many different entry points for accessing issues, right, is because people are basically looking for the level at which the data is interpretable to them. Right? When does it start to make sense what's going on? And, and that's going to be at different places for different people. Now, the thing that's interesting about Neurath in terms of his project was that he thought and, you know, that there could be some kind of universal language for this, right? That if you got the pictures just right, you know, abstract, you know, kind of these international codes for, you know, for toilets, for example, things like this, that no matter what kind of framework you're coming from, you'd be able to interpret the pictures in a certain way. That was kind of his ideal, and that's a very logical, positivist way of thinking about this. Now, however, all of that, which is fine, um, still leaves us with the question of explainability, okay? And there, I think, um, that is where there's a real, I would say, that's where the post-truth condition comes in, right? Because explainability is ultimately about the question of whether there is a privileged framework in terms of which you interpret the data, 
right? Um, so when we talk about, you know, science providing the ultimate explanation for everything, uh, that is kind of what we mean, right? That in some sense, science is a privileged framework. Um, and um, I think that's where the real debate is from with regard to the post-truth condition is on the explainability issue. Uh, because a lot's going to depend on how people who have interpreted the data kind of put it into this larger framework from which then they take decisions and, and draw conclusions. Okay. Um, and this is interesting, of course, right, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, the, the, the issue that comes to mind uh, whenever I think about this very much, uh, and Oren mentioned it when he introduced me, was the, the creationism issue, right? Um, you know, uh, where, where there's a sense in which that's an example, where there's a real substantial disagreement, uh, not, uh, you know, in terms of the general explanations that are being provided for data, that for the most part aren't interpreted so differently from each other at, at the level at which interpretation normally happens, but explainability wise, very different, right? And very different conclusions drawn as a result. So that's kind of where I would, I would you know, leave the issue that the post-truth thing really comes in uh, with the explainability problem. Maya, would you like to, uh, would you like to re re rebut or, 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 or ask a further question? Or are you good? Um, yeah, I would like to ask, hi. Uh, hi. I, I would like to ask who is actually responsible for this uh, task of explainability to the public? Especially, let's take this current uh, um, pandemic situation. Who is in charge of explaining to the public this data? Well, I mean, you know, you could, you know, there, there are all kinds of uh, nominal political ways of making that decision, and they have been making that decision. So, you know, I'm sure in your country, as in my, we have chief medical officers, chief scientific officers, they say official things every day, and then people draw their own conclusions from it, okay? Um, so, in the set, you know, and, and, and I think the problem is that uh, authority, and this is where we get to Plato's problem, authority uh, is is only so enforceable in a democracy, okay? Um, so a lot depends, see, uh, the way I would interpret your question to be productive, to give you a productive kind of answer, is that if you think that the way in which people, you know, understand what's going on with the pandemic and, and, and interpreting and explaining things and then doing stuff, if you don't think it's adequate, then I think the, uh, the onus, the burden of proof is actually on those who think people should think otherwise, right, they, they need to I think the authorities, the so-called authorities, the people who think they know better than everyone else, need to smarten up their act rhetorically. They need to actually be able to do a better job communicating. That's the bottom line, I would say, right? Um, you can't just say, we're the guys who know stuff, right? We're the people in power. I, I think that only gets you so far in this argument. I think at the end of the day, it is a rhetorical argument. It is about, and, and the rhetor, and when I mean rhetorical, I mean it in the basic sense that you have to understand where people are coming from when they're disagreeing with you, right? You have to understand what is their framework? You know, wh wh where, where are they coming from? Why can't they accept this obvious truth, et cetera? And you have to be able to plug into that and appeal to it. And, and I have to say, Bernays in the history of public relations was all about that, right? He was all about that. He was about figuring out what is it that people are already thinking and how can I use that, right, to sell a person, sell a product, and to sell the truth, right? And it seems to me that this is the approach, I think, that people who, in a way, want to improve, you know, by their lights what the public thinks, that's the strategy they ought to be adopting. I, I, I mean, you know, again, you know, we're talking in generalities, but that would be my general approach. So there's a question, a, a sort of follow-up question here from Orr Kupferberg, I guess. Do you think that liquid democracy can better deal with the challenges of post-truth? Well, like, yes, in, in a general kind of way, yes. I mean, I think li liquid democracy is basically consumer capitalism. But, uh, um, but I think the problem, comes, um, the problem comes with situations like this. Again, to go back to the point, it relates to the complexity point and all the rest of it. Uh, that when there are these, there are so many externalities from people's decisions that could be potentially negative, that we actually need something a bit more structured, a bit more constitutional, 
right? So that in some sense we can channel and mitigate what these externalities. Um, and I think that's the challenge in the post-truth condition is that. But I do think a kind of generally speaking liquid democratic approach is kind of the default position. Okay, another question from Ori. Um, recently, we had an anti-vaccine supporting doctor going on social media calling people with corona to walk outside. Authorities immediately ordered the removal of his viral post. Am I correct to say that if, that, that, um, that if your view would be adopted by policymakers, the post would stay online? Very difficult. It's very difficult. At this point, I have a lot of sympathy for Mark Zuckerberg, because in a sense, this is kind of the thing he's always being faced with, right? And, right. and even, before, even before this pandemic. Um, uh, I, I, would, I, I would need to, leave, I would need to um, look at the details of the case, to be perfectly honest. But again, my response, my instinctive response is a bit like my response to the previous question, which is that, um, if you don't want, you know, if you want people to get vaccines and if you want people to pay attention to the official advice on the coronavirus and all the rest of it, you got to smarten your rhetorical act to undermine these people. And, and what I mean by undermining them is not censoring them, because if you censor them, then you know there's going to be this backlash and people are going to feel sympathetic and all this stuff, right? Um, you know, and authoritarianism is going to be laid at your doorstep and all the rest of it. So what you have to do is, in some sense, you've got to be able to beat them on their own terms rhetorically, okay? Um, and, and, I, and I don't know this particular guy. I don't know how this guy actually operates and why he has such a great following. But the point is, it seems to me that you have to understand what is a, a, a attracting people to this guy and then use that against him. That would, I think, be the, the instinctive way to go on this matter, you know, rather than just a, you know, a, a sort of straight censorship. So again, it's about improving rhetorical communication skills. Okay, so a further question here on, on this, in the same vein from Nir Aliyev. He really wants uh, your opinion about how different countries um, have um, dealt with the coronavirus in terms of um, spreading fake news themselves and to talk about the differences between countries in this respect. <laughs> I mean, fake news by definition is very elusive. <laughs> um, I mean, look, uh, let me make a, I'll make a couple of observations about this, okay? Uh, we, 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 we would not, I mean, at least, at least this is my, my view, okay? I might be wrong. But I think the degree of worldwide attention um, and panic in many cases about this virus was largely set in place at the very beginning because of that doctor in Wuhan, right, who, when he was faced with these overflowing hospitals, right, went on social media and started talking about this, okay? Um, and this went viral, right? This went viral in December. Um, and I think that really and because, and, you know, if you think about a country, you know, and this is where I think social media has been an incredibly interesting and determining force in the way we have kind of um, responded to and acted around this virus. OK. Um, and, and, and I think it goes back to that in the sense that um, under normal circumstances, but, you know, if we if we were living even, let's say, 10 years ago. And let's say there was this doctor in a Chinese hospital who um, panicked because he saw this number, you know, large numbers of people with respiratory ailments coming into the hospital and nobody being able to cope with them. Uh, that guy would have been suppressed immediately. You'd never find out about him, right? And the Chinese government might have put the lockdowns and, and all the rest of it into place like they did, um, but it wouldn't have had the kind of media vibe going right, which then really contributed to how the rest of the world framed this situation, okay? Um, and so I, I think to a large extent, one shouldn't underestimate the role that social media has played in stirring this up. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, um, because one of the interesting consequences of it 
is that it has uh, actually put a very harsh light simultaneously across all the public health care systems around the world, as well as all the different kinds of political regimes that exist around the world. Right, so everyone's now on the, in, you know, under the spotlight at once, and so what you're seeing is very much this thing we witness every day, where various countries are being compared with each other, you know, not only in terms of the number of deaths and you know cases and all that, but also in terms of how they're responding, and so all kinds of judgments are being made in this context. This is the first time this kind of thing has really happened in real time, right, where we're getting all these kind of cross-cultural comparisons making, taking place, where people are making all kinds of, drawing all kinds of conclusions about what's going on here, there, and everywhere, okay? Um, and, and so I'm really hesitant to use the word fake news in this context, uh, because I think there's a real, um, this, is, this is in a sense a moment of the democratization of information, right? Um, where we're really forced to kind of sort things out for ourselves. Um, and, and I'm just, let me just speak, uh, you know, living in the United Kingdom. Um, and again, I don't know how you guys understand what we're doing, but, um, we are the, the official presentation of this is being very much led by a certain kind of scientific understanding of how these things unfold. And so the government is constantly telling us right, that there is a plan and we act at a certain, you know, we do a certain thing at a certain time, and all of this is being flagged in the media very much a day before it happens. So people actually get some advance notice, um, and, and one of the things that, that's been noticeable uh, that, that a lot of people have criticized, but is very much part of the UK strategy, is that this is not just about, you know, epidemiological theories about herd immunity and all this stuff, though it is about that, I think. Um, but it's also about using this kind of nudge strategy from the behavioral sciences, right? There is a nudge unit uh, in Downing Street. Um, you know, so in other words, the way that people are approached about this is quite distinctive. It, it's kind of a soft approach in a way. Uh, and, and it's only when people don't comply that then stronger restrictions get put in. And this is all planned. This is not happening in a panic from the government standpoint. Now, to be sure, there are a lot of people out there, you know, who are claiming, ah, the National Health Service should have more beds and should have more masks and more ventilators. And this is because all you neoliberals out there have been starving the National Health Service for the past 10, 20, whatever years. Um, and, and of course, that's true, but they're saying that all the time, okay? Um, and, and, and so, you know, there's a sense in which a lot of the negative reporting or the negative response to what our government is doing is coming uh, from the usual suspects in that respect. Again, this is not, I'm not trying to justify what the government's doing, but I do think these kinds of issues do need to be taken into account when one's trying to assess exactly what's going on in an environment where information is available to so many people simultaneously that there are going to be, you know, axes grinding, there are going to be, um, you know, and, and look, at the end of the day, um, unless you try, uh, you, I, I guess I would assume that the government is actually giving you as good data as you're likely to get about this on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of people who are speculating that there is actually many more deaths or many more cases, um, they are speculating. I mean, the thing that complicates it all, of course, is that different countries are actually counting things differently, right? That's a big issue, right? And, and, and the counting is related to the different strategies being taken, right? So Germany, for example, has this very, uh, you know, high number of cases, but relatively low deaths, but they do a lot of testing, okay? And they had the tests already available and God bless them, that's wonderful. In the UK, where we don't have so many tests available, we've only been testing the people who actually show the symptoms. And so the death rate looks higher, even though we have fewer cases, okay? All of the, you know, in different countries are, you know, doing these things differently. So that has to be taken into account too. So under the circumstances, I don't see, I mean, there are a lot of ways one can analyze this and there are a lot of ways one can criticize what various people are doing and so forth. 
but I really don't think fake news is a helpful concept here. Okay, so <laughs> fake news is not a helpful concept, but C.P. Lazar Shoef wants to know um, why we're constantly told that fake, well, she says, we, we're constantly, constantly told that fake news spreads faster than actual news, and she wants to know why that is. <laughs> Is it, is, it, is it due to the platform? Is it due to the content? I, I think, look, I think this kind of issue, I've seen some of the studies that have, that have allegedly shown this, um, and, and they do show it actually, but the kind of stuff we're talking about is pretty straightforward, okay? Where, you know, there's a general agreement, something was the case and something that's not the case is being promoted. Um, but I think most of the issues about about fake news, you know, I mean, most of the issues that we're talking about here with regard to the pandemic and how to respond to it and all that um, is sufficiently uncertain and ambiguous that I don't think it's that easy to encompass a lot of that in terms of that rubric, right? So, you know, so there is, and, and again, there is a kind of a sliding scale issue here, right? Uh, you know, when, when are we talking about when people are saying stuff that's, you know, false, in, in, in the sense of uh, a lot of the things that were said about Hillary Clinton, let's say in the 2016 campaign, which were, which were false, right? Um, and, and just basically meant to kind of destabilize her image in some way, um, versus saying, you know, what happened in the Brexit campaign when um, there was that notorious bus, right? Uh, you may remember there was this, uh, you know, big red double-decker bus, right, that had pasted on it um, that 350 million pounds a week would be available to the National Health Service if, once the UK leaves the European Union. Now, that figure, okay, is basically the figure that the UK would be saving per week um, once it left the European Union and wasn't making complete contributions into it. That's what that figure is, actually, right? Now, of course, um, not all of that money even if it, once it was returned, would actually go to the National Health Service, that's for sure, okay? So the National Health Service would get, you know, much less of that amount. And also the, the UK, insofar as it wanted to remain part of various European programs, such as educational and research programs, would have to pay some of that money back in, okay? So, so you know, 350 million pounds uh, is definitely not the correct figure. Uh, with regard to what the, you know, what would actually go into the National Health Service. Nevertheless, the figure is not just picked out of the sky, right? Um, and, and I think the way it was interpreted, this is more to the point, I think the way it was interpreted by the voters who took it seriously was also not picked out of the sky. In other words, what this figure, false as it is, nevertheless points to right, is the fact that there would be this clawing back of money, and that clawing back of money w is kind of, you might say, a kind of symbol of sovereignty, of the rec uh, reclaiming of national sovereignty. And so the people who came up, Dominic Cummings, you may have heard of him, Boris Johnson's advisor, and number 10, who came up with this kind of strategy, that's what they're doing, right? See, that's much closer to a kind of public relations campaign. That's because what that does is it starts by tapping into sentiments that people already have, and it does so in a very clever way because people are very concerned about the health issues and they're concerned about national sovereignty. And so you put them together and you put this figure, okay? Now the figure is strictly speaking false, at least from the standpoint of what the NHS would actually get, but it is actually the amount of money that would come back to the UK. So this is a much trickier issue. To me, this is a much grayer area than simply fabricating stories about, you know, Hillary Clinton being a pedophile or something. So, um, can I have a, um, a follow-up? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, what I think uh, is a more interesting question than I, that is follow up for my for my uh, other question is um, what kind of knowledge or um, news are uh, are automatically 
is a suspect as being fake. And I think when you ask this question, you can draw the line between the normal and the acceptable knowledge than the less acceptable knowledge. And I'll give you an example. My sister is a, is a acupuncture therapist. Uh -huh. she, today, she, she had this uh, post in uh, Facebook uh, and that she shared with the other um, acupuncture, acupuncture therapist uh, that, that, that said that everybody talks about how the Chinese closed everyone at their houses, but no one talks about uh, the acupuncture medicine in China that actually helped the, um, uh, the patient uh, to, to get well. And when I, when I read this uh, post, I said it was really clever, but I think if I'm going to publish it, the first thing that people will say to me is that this is fake news because it's not the normal kind of knowledge that we are used to have. So I think it's really interesting to, to look at it from this, from this kind of way. Um, what, is, what, what makes, uh, <laughs> what, beside of that, that it's not true, what automatically makes us think that this is not a genuine news or genuine knowledge? Okay, let, let me, I see what you're saying. Uh, here I want to say something a little bit hopeful about um, this kind of internet world we live in. Um, most of the time when people make claims like the one about acupuncture that you mentioned, um, they usually provide some kind of link as a source, okay? I mean, that is really quite normal these days. Um, and, and that does give, the opportunity, give an opportunity for people uh, to check the source and see what they make of it, whether the source seems reliable or not, okay? Um, you know, so there's a, you know, this is the kind of thing, you know, as a baseline, what Wikipedia uses, right? If you look at the kind of rules that Wikipedia uses in terms of how it uh, includes things in its entries, it's basically whether they're sourced in you know, by what they regard as a reputable source, and, and a reputable source for them is a, they have a very liberal interpretation of what's a reputable source, but nevertheless, it, there's a source, right? Um, and, and, and I think that's the key thing, right? As long as the claim has a source, then, you know, it, it, you know there's a kind of buyer beware kind of mentality. Check the source. What do you make of it, right? That, that would be my first instinct for that particular claim that you made, because to my mind, I, I don't know what to make of that claim by itself, to be honest with you, okay? I don't have any strong intuitions about whether that claim might be true or false, um, but I would check the source, and then, you know, and that might lead me to check other things as well, um, and, and that's kind of how I would assume those kinds of claims would be assessed, at least, no? I mean, that I don't know if people would automatically believe stuff like that. Oh. I can't hear you. Who's speaking? It wasn't me. Oh, okay. Um, I say maybe, and I think when you when you say check the source for this uh, reliability uh, has inside of it uh, inside this claim has this uh, this the, the 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 basic assumption you have on. Uh, a reliable source. What, what, what do you mean? I mean, so what, what are you talking about exactly? Uh, for example, uh, I, I believe um, many people in the Western world, uh, scientific uh, evidence would be more reliable to their eyes. Uh, um, a source from a, a medical institution. But if you see a Chinese source written in Chinese, not in English, uh, doesn't have any numbers, doesn't have any visualization, 
uh, have a language that we doesn't recognize and um, uh, phrases that we don't doesn't recognize <laughs> of this beside the content beside of it's true make us don't believe that it is reliable so check the source i don't think it's enough well look i mean but checking the source involves a lot of different things okay it's it's not it's not so simple i mean and so for example let's say this stuff let's say this stuff's in chinese um you know you've got google translate there you know it is possible i mean again the internet gives us a lot of resources on a very easy basis to actually get to dig a little deeper into stuff like this okay and also if you're getting this message it's pretty unlikely you're the only person getting this message so you can kind of see what other people have said in response to it i mean there are, there are a lot of ways you can go about this i mean admittedly none of these amount to some kind of foolproof scientific method but it's not like you're just left alone to your own devices to figure things out without any help i mean um and it's true at the end of the day you have to decide whether you believe this or not and to what degree you believe this and you know to be honest with you unless you plan to act on this you can probably live with a false belief about this so this is Seriously. actually this, this is a good uh, place to, to interject with a question about the relationship between truth and action noam Yuran uh, asks we want to believe that if people would know the truth scientific or otherwise they would also somehow act responsibly. My, my question is, my question is, uh, Noam writes, whether with this hope we miss the actual relationship between knowledge and action. This possibility arises specifically in relation to the contemporary form of post-truth, Trump, Trump, et cetera, where people seem to choose their truth according to their political allegiances and not vice versa. Well, I mean, okay, look, um, I actually don't think uh, Trump is that significant as far from an epistemological standpoint, okay? In other words, I think people have always been sort of uh, choosing, you know, there is a sense in which the politics or the larger normative structure in which people operate have always sort of inclined them one way rather than another. I think now it's just kind of, in a way, made more visible, made more transparent. Um, and I think that's, I mean, um, to give you, um, you know, to give you an example, okay, uh, of where I'm coming from on this. Um, one of the things that's become very interesting, when, when, um, when Breitbart News, you may know about Breitbart, Breitbart News, which is this uh, news feed, um, which is associated with the alt-right in the United States, um, and, and the, the Trump advisor, uh, Steve Bannon, former Trump advisor Steve Bannon, was the CEO of this thing. Um, Breitbart News had an enormous amount of impact, I think, in the way in which uh, people thought about news media. Because um, until Breitbart, because Breitbart was quite clearly, even more so than Fox News and all these other kind of right-wing channels, was really quite, um, you know, quite obviously framing you know, all sorts of political issues from across, you know, all topics in a particular kind of way for a particular kind of demographic, much more targeted than, than we'd ever seen before. And I think one of the consequences of that has, you know, once people realized that was being done, uh, they didn't say we should shut it down. A lot of people liked it actually, but what it did cause was for people to look at the uh, so-called legacy media, the traditional media, and to become much more self-conscious about the kinds of political framing and biases that have all, always already been there. So the New York Times and the Washington Post and all these newspapers uh, in the United States, um, all, and CNN and all the rest of it, and all of a sudden they start getting under scrutiny in a way uh, that they weren't before, and I think people people began to take a lot more seriously the possibility, and Trump definitely promotes this idea, right, that they are just as biased. They are just, you know, and they have their own access to grind, and they have their own framework. And I think this is the post-truth thing, right? The post-truth thing um, is not about, uh, you know, the idea that people are suddenly thinking in political terms about what to believe, but they're now becoming more self-conscious about it uh, and, and so they do think 
that in a sense, um, when they're making a choice about what newspaper to read, they're making a choice that simultaneously is about their political orientation and about what they think is true. They think those two things do go together. Um, and, and, and I think that is kind of what the post-truth condition gives us. It gives us something, you might say, closer to a level playing field where the, because um, here's the thing, I mean, this is a byproduct, by the way, of the way the media has changed with the uh, advent of, the so of social media. Because what's basically broken down here is the broadcast model. The broadcast model was basically a pyramid structure where you had relatively few people broadcasting, um, you know, relatively few channels, relatively few newspapers of any kind of authority, right? And then the mass is basically just receiving the stuff, okay? That model breaks down uh, first with the internet, but more particularly with social media. And so now the producers and the distributors of information are a much more equal level, okay? Um, and so people are much more comfortable with the idea that they will choose uh, a news source because it is compatible with their political beliefs and it gives them the kinds of things that they think they need to know. The point is they were always doing that, okay? They were always doing that, but now it is made much more self-conscious and made much more of a choice. And I think if Trump can be credited or blamed with anything, is about raising the level of self-consciousness to the kinds of choices that people have been making about media all along. And I would say this explains why something like the New York Times and CNN have done this kind of double down thing of, of saying they're more truer than true kind of stuff, right? Which, which to be honest with you, I find very annoying. Right, that the New York Times and CNN just, you know, they are ramping up the truthiness uh, in a way that, that uh, uh, you know, seems very unbecoming. And it's quite clear that they're doing this basically because they are on the attack on the president. I mean, whether they should, you know, whether the president's doing anything right or wrong, uh, that I think is a separate question. But the way in which the media has responded to it is really telling, and it feeds into Trump's argument, to be perfectly honest. I think the way the CNN and the New York Times deal with Trump just feeds Trump's argument completely. And that's because they are the ones who don't really quite see what the post-truth condition means. They have to appeal to, they have to appeal to readers and to viewers who, in a sense, are make, see themselves as empowered to make decisions for themselves and there's no reason why they need to bow down to these guys, right? They can go to other sources. They do have other sources to go to. And so if you want to keep them in line, if you want people to watch your channel, if you want people to buy your newspaper, then you have to appeal to them in, in something that is more directly relevant to them than just making, you know, abstract appeals to the truth or calling the president a liar every day. Um, so I think we're going to begin to wind down. Um, there's a question here from Israel who says, how do you relate to the wisdom of crowds? What do you want to say about the wisdom of crowds? Well, I mean, I think let's put it this way. I, I don't want to get, a, in a broad way, I'm kind of sympathetic to it. Okay. In a broad way, I'm kind of sympathetic to it, but, um, I do think that you don't go down this route uh, with your eyes closed. In other words, I do think um, if you are going to be trusting crowds, democracy, whatever, um, you really got to be prepared for a bumpy ride, okay? Um, and you, you, you know, you, you can't, you, you, you in, a, in a sense, this is kind of, um, you know, the wisdom of crowds is kind of what gave us Trump, right? I mean, uh, and, and you, you have to be, you have to be prepared uh, for, for what follows. Uh, and, and so um, I do think what, what it amounts to in practice for those, because I do think in a sense, this kind of discussion about wisdom of crowds um, needs to be uh, really contextualized uh, to us, the academics, right, who are having this discussion. Because we are the ones uh, who are being, uh, you know, as the world becomes more democratic, being um, delegitimized, disempowered, whatever you want to call it, right? At least we cannot, as it were, presume 
the same uh, level of epistemic authority at the outset that we might be used to, that in a sense, we have to make our knowledge claims in a sense to a much wider public who feels more empowered and, and feels much more confident that they've got the right to say no to you. Um, and, and I think, you know, for example, I think that, um, you know, if you look at both the, the, the 2016 presidential election in the U.S. and, and Brexit, um, you will see that this is something that the, uh, you know, the expert, elite class, whatever, just radically, you know, underestimated. You know, and the rhetoric that was coming from the people who we would have been supporting. So I supported Hillary Clinton. I even supported Hillary Clinton against Obama in 2008. I really like Hillary Clinton, okay? And I was very much against Brexit, okay? But the bottom line is, if you look at the rhetoric that was being used, uh, it was talking down to people. Really, it was, it was basically kind of the pat pat patrician voice, the paternalistic voice. It was saying, look, you know, we've got this under control, you know, and all the rest of it. Um, and in a sense, I think we, we are going to struggle as academics in terms of trying to reshape our voice so that we get anything like the kind of credibility that we've traditionally uh, enjoyed. And I think this is where Walter Lippmann, I think, was really sensitive to this with regard to how he wanted to frame journalism and the media in terms of how it represented itself so that it could be a kind of authoritative voice that nevertheless respected, you know, the democratic nature of the society that he was moving into. And I think this is the thing. This is a thing. We're the ones who, in a sense, are going to have to change. And I think that's the toughest issue, much tougher, you know, uh, th than, uh, you know, people believing, you know, that the, that the masses might believe the wrong thing or something like that. I, I think that's not as big a problem as what we need to do. We haven't yet figured out how we need to present ourselves publicly in light of this greater democratization. All right. So uh, if I may, I'm, I'm just going to ask, ask one uh, last question because I think we're out of questions. Um, and as you were speaking, I mean, I found this super interesting. I, uh, I, I remember um, reminded of this book, Do you know, this book by Justin E. Smith, which is called um, A History of the Dark Side of Reason, Irrationality, A History of the Dark Side. Of I Reason. haven't read it, but I have heard of it. So tell yeah, me what well, I need to know about this book. I had to review it. So, so I read it. Um, and basically, his argument there is that the harder we struggle for reason, the more we lapse into unreason. Uh, it's an historical argument. It's kind of like a, a, it's a, an argument of disgruntlement. You know, he says, you have the enlightenment. It's met with the counter-enlightenment. You know, individualism as an ideology kind of seems to morph into tribalism, since what we gain in freedom is inevitably lost in security. Um, and it's kind of like an angry book. I think it's sort of like a middle-aged kind of angry book of disillusionment. Um, I wasn't crazy about the book, but um, and so and and so one of one, you know, what what my answer was that sort of to this kind of historical argument is that we're the product of a process uh, of natural and contingent evolution. We human beings. We're not an exercise in rational engineering. Um, and yet the fact that we as individuals have always acted more or less reasonably within the cultural systems in which we reside, whatever you know, political system they be, be they democratic or authoritarian or secular or shamanistic, it doesn't matter. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, um, this is Barilan, I shouldn't be holding this, but anyways. Um, is, um, is really neither here nor there with respect to the, to the greater march of history. Because rationality is really the stuff of networks built by many people over time with the help of tools, uh, technologies, procedures within institutions. It's not an attribute of individuals. Um, and this very much chimes with, what, with, with a lot of what you're saying today. So my question, I guess, is um, given sort of the historical sketch that you've, uh, that you've provided this evening, what do you think um, is, um, will be, and, sh uh, and then what do you think should be the reaction of the scientific 
or the, the institution of science, if you can, you can speak of it in such broad terms, to the post-truth uh, condition. What do you think has, ha what has happened over the last, say, 20 years? Uh, where do you think it's going? And where would, you, where would you like to see it go in terms of how the institution changes and adapts and modifies itself? Okay, um, first of all, uh, I actually think uh, that science has been changing uh, in, in the right ways. Um, and um, what I mean by that is, um, and, I, and here I think actually the internet has been helpful. I mean, I think one of the things uh, is uh, that the internet has enabled people to do, again, is to find their own entry point into science. So one of the things that has become immediately demystified is the idea that you need to have a P you need to have a PhD or you need to have some kind of advanced degree or formal science training in order to be able to say anything intelligent about science, um, and and so you know as a result people are able to plug in at many different levels. They're also aided by the fact that for a variety of reasons over uh, well let's say over the past 40, 50 years maybe uh, there has been this growth of the field of science communication. Uh, and, and uh, you know, with television, with books, with magazines, and, and some of these pig people, quite helpfully, and, and here I would cite Richard Dawkins, who's not my, you know, I'm not his greatest fan, and, he, and, you know, but nevertheless, I do think somebody like Richard Dawkins is a kind of crossover figure between the public and scientific community, and there are many more people like that, um, in a way present a kind of quite a variety of you might say images of what it is to be scientific, to think scientifically, to interact with public issues as a scientist and so forth. And I think the more different images of that that are out there, and they are getting out there, uh, the more people will feel comfortable with the idea that science is a very important form of knowledge, but nevertheless it is one that is subject to an enormous amount of diversity. There are a lot of ways of interpreting it and a lot of ways of, of pushing things in lots of different directions. Um, so, um, and, and, and look, the point is, um, you know, one of the things I think is pretty consistent about most of the research that's been done on uh, so-called public understanding of science is that even as people have um, lowered their trust of science, scientists as experts, nevertheless, their interest in science, they're wanting to find out more about science, they're wanting to maybe take decisions related to science into their own hands, right? That's increased, okay? Um, and, and, and it seems to me that's a good thing. I mean, it's a bit treacherous. I'm not gonna deny that. And I think with the issue of the vaccination business, for example, right? I think this is, I, I would say the vaccination business is, is one area where the kind of thing I've just described is very much out there and could end up having a lot of disastrous consequences. Um, but nevertheless, I do think that this general trend of where, as it were, uh, science is democratized in a very full kind of sense, where you both see kind of the internal diversity of science, but also people feel more willingness to actually participate in it in their own way. I think that is a, a generally good thing, and I think that's the kind of thing that's likely to happen in the long term. I think the key point uh, for people who are the gatekeepers of scientific institutions, for the people who are in the forms of official authority within science, is they should, they should really stop the paternalism. They, this is not to say they should not be making their pitches to the public and they shouldn't be trying to persuade the public to believe certain things and so forth, but what is not going to be welcomed or tolerated is paternalism. Um, and in fact, you know, what will kill paternalism in the end, and this is part of where we are with this culture of transparency, is people, people keeping track of when the experts get stuff wrong, okay? Then they'll become very unforgiving because if the experts put themselves up in some kind of pedestal that they know better than everyone else, okay? And then they get it wrong and it becomes really obvious they get it wrong, then you'll see the backlash. And so the time is now in this period of greater transparency that the people who are running our scientific institutions to stop once and for all using this paternalistic rhetoric and trying to devise some kind of more appropriate democratic rhetoric. 
like I said, it is already happening to a large extent. It is naturally happening, but there is still these pockets of paternalism that really need to check themselves. I just recently uh, attended my first Twitter conference in biology. Uh -huh. and the idea was that the guy who, 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 who created the conference, uh, who convened the conference, does a lot of his science on Twitter mm -hmm. because he's sick of the gatekeepers. And he has a, he has a very, and he's, he's actually a, very, a leading scientist and has a, a, a broad community of scientists with whom he, you know, and when they have a result, which is interesting, they put it up and, you know, and the idea is why, why don't you let the good, the good results just, you know, come to the fore, float, and we don't want to wait for some uh, reviewer to say that we use the wrong font. Oh uh, yeah, no, no, let me, I'll, I'll tell you, peer review yeah. and, the, and, the, and the institution surrounding it they are up for the chopping block, the guillotine. If, you know, I, I think uh, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but this is something that definitely is going to change. Yeah. So, Steve, um, I think we're going to end now. Um, okay. I, 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 wanted to, uh, I wanted to really thank you um, um, from... Uh, you got a nice house, man. <laughs> it's my new house. Yeah, we just moved to Jerusalem. But anyways, uh, last time you were here, we went. We all went out. And we had a good time. Corona. Oh my God. So I, I uh, they're gonna I, have to change that beer. <laughs> I'm empathetic to Corona. They've lost hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, we raise our glass to you and thanks so well, much. Thank you. For us this thank you. Time. Well, thank you. And 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 so this will be put online. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, Will this be put online? Yes, it will be put online. Is Please, I, I think this was really good. Yeah, it was great. It was great. We really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, and thanks, everyone, for... Uh, for well, thank uh, you, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Stay good safe. Night. I know. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, should that go on? Bye-bye. Should that go on? Yes, that go on.